a young man ran into his uh, pastor in town, was talking to him, and uh, the young man confessed. He said, you know, um, I'm really guilty of the sin of pride. He said, I struggle with it um, a lot. He goes, I actually find myself looking in the mirror a lot. And uh, he said, I look at myself in the mirror and I go, man, you are a good looking dude. He said, uh, so he described just a little bit more how he felt about himself. And he said to his preacher, he goes, well, what do you think about that? The preacher said, well, that's, that's not really pride. And the guy said, oh, it's not? He goes, no, son. He goes, you're just mistaken. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I wonder if the whole pride issue affects uh, people you know and how they view themselves. Not only how they view themselves, but maybe it affects a number of other areas of their life. Matter of fact, you probably can picture someone in your mind who when you hear that word pride or you hear the word arrogant or you hear a description of someone who thinks more highly than themselves than they ought to, um, their picture comes to your mind very quickly. This morning I want us to look, we're going to be in 2 Kings chapter 5 and we're going to look at an account there of a guy named Naaman. And, and he deals with this issue of pride in a number of different ways. And if you want to go ahead and follow along, we're just going to dive right in. 2 Kings chapter 5, verse 1, it says, The king of Aram, now Aram would be what you and I would probably know as Syria. Um, it was to the north of Israel back in that time. The king of Aram had great admiration for Naaman, the commander of his army. Because through him, the Lord had given Aram great victories. But though Naaman was a mighty warrior, he suffered from leprosy. And if, if you're familiar with um, the Bible at that time, you had Israel split into two kingdoms. And to the north of Israel was this nation of Syria. And, and they were completely, um, they were stuck between Assyria and Israel. And Assyria to the northeast was a a phenomenal war machine at that time, and they kept attacking, and they kept attacking, and they kept attacking Syria, or Aram, as we just read. And, and it appears to be that King Ben-Hadad II was able to, through his commander Naaman, repel a lot of these attacks. And so as the account unfolds, we'd see over the next couple verses that this idea of leprosy is something that comes to light. Naaman has leprosy. In that day and age, it was pretty much a death sentence. It's not something that we deal with today, so it's probably something that you and I would not be as familiar as we might be with other common occurrences in, in the medical community. But I want to describe to you what was quite possibly plaguing Naaman. And it's a disease today that exists in some pockets of some third world countries, but for all intents and purposes has been eradicated in the U.S. just through a simple regimen of antibiotics and some other medicines. Naaman has what might be known to doctors today as Hansen's disease. And Dr. Alan Gillen writes this, it, talking about the Hansen's disease or leprosy, it did not kill, but neither did it seem to end. Instead, it lingered for years, causing the tissues to degenerate and the body to deform. Many have thought that leprosy was a disease of the skin, but it's better classified as a disease of the nervous system because it attacks the nerves. Its symptoms start in the skin and the peripheral nervous system, and then it spreads to other parts of the body, such as hands, feet, face, and earlobes. Patients with leprosy experience disfigurement of the skin and the bones, the twisting of limbs, the, the curling of fingers to form the characteristic claw hand. Facial changes include the thickening of outer ear and the collapsing of the nose. Tumor-like growths form on the skin and in the respiratory tract, a lot of times causing coughing spasms and, and blood as the coughing occurs. The optic nerve may deteriorate. The doctor says, though, however, the largest number of deformities occur because of the development of a loss of the pain sensation due to extensive nerve damage. And he goes on to say, so patients who have this might pick up a boiling cup of water and severely burn their hands, but they would never know it. And so a lot of these extra uh, injuries are what leads to the death with this disease. So Naaman, this mighty war general, this person that everybody respects, um, leads people into battle. My guess would be at first he probably dismissed it. Oh, that's just an old war wound. And as it began to flourish and as it began to develop on his body, I, I would imagine he probably, like most people, tried to hide it. 
but it's reached a point where uh, his king now knows about it. There's some family members that know about it. Those in his inner circle know about it. And so in verse 2, he tells his king, he says, um, this is what I, I have going on. We see in verses 2 down through 11, this is what I have going on. The servant girl of my wife is telling me that there's a prophet in Israel that can heal me. And the king says, well, by all means, go. And so the king writes this letter, basically introducing Naaman. He gives him all these gifts. He sends him off on his way. Naaman shows up in Samaria, the capital of Israel, and he presents the letter to the king of Israel. The king of Israel is just fit to be tied, as you might well imagine. Because not only has Syria, Aram, and not only have they had these battles going on with Assyria, to the northeast, there have also been border skirmishes where the Syrians have raiding parties that are crossing the southern border into Israel and attacking. Now, here comes the general of that army to the king of Israel, and he says, here's a letter from my king. And the letter says, please accept these gifts and please heal my humble servant, Naaman. And I love Joram's response in First Kings chapter or Second Kings chapter five because he goes, "Is this guy trying to pick a fight? Who am I that I can give life back to this walking dead man?" And we slide on down into verses eleven through thirteen, and we read this as Naaman and, and kind of set the backstory. The king of Israel is dismayed. Elisha the prophet hears about it and says. Send Naaman on to my house. So Naaman arrives at Elisha's house. Elisha doesn't come out. Elisha doesn't say hello. Elisha doesn't so much as say, get off my property. He sends a servant out, and the servant goes, hey, you need to travel to the Jordan River, and you need to bathe there in the Jordan River. So in verse 11, Naaman became angry and stalked away. I thought he, talking about Elisha, the prophet, that was going to heal him. I thought he would certainly come out to meet me, he said. I expected him to wave his hand over the leprosy and call on the name of the Lord his God and heal me. And, and then he goes on basically to point out, and he wants me to go bathe in that, that dirty, the dirty mud hole of a river, the Jordan River. I, there are better rivers back in my homeland. In verse 13, his officers tried to reason with him. He said, sir, if the prophet had told you to do something very difficult, wouldn't you have done it? So certainly shouldn't you obey him when he says simply go and wash and be cured? Now stop right there for a second. Naaman has traveled over 100 miles, well over 100 miles. He's sick. He's in a lot of pain. He's been on horseback. He finally gets to Elisha's house. Elisha doesn't even so much as come out and say, hello, how you doing? Let me shake the dust off. He sends a servant out. And Naaman is ticked. He's put out. And then Elisha, Elisha's servant says, you got to go far. It would be the equivalent of you and I arriving at a destination here, not meeting the person we're expecting to meet, but somebody that we don't even know representing him comes out and says, uh, yeah, by the way, you need to go on over to Terre Haute and you need to take a bath in the Wabash and that will get you better. I mean, for a lot of us, we'd be going, <laughs> I think of a lot of other places I'd rather bathe. And that's where Naaman's at in this story. He, he definitely had a need. He needed to be healed, but as disabilitating as the leprosy was, really the healing he needed wasn't physical, wasn't just physical. He needed a healing that was far greater. He needed a healing from a, a spiritual leprosy that plagues many people, even in America yet today. And it's a leprosy that it's a leprosy that disfigures, it's a leprosy that desensitizes, it's a leprosy that destroys relationships between us, between the people you love, and between God and you. And that, that spiritual leprosy would be described in the Bible as pride. Pride. And, and I just want us, as we begin talking about that, to understand that when we talk about pride, we're not talking about you and I saying of our children, I'm really proud of what my children have accomplished. We're not talking about a, a, a sense of a satisfaction over an accomplishment. Well, I'm really proud of, of what I did. We're, we're not talking about that sense of satisfaction. We're talking about something the Scripture says uh, distorts our view of the world. 
Jonathan Edwards, a great preacher in the past, said, Pride is more difficult to be discerned than any other corruption because of its very nature. He goes on to say, that is, pride is a person having too high opinion of himself. Is it any surprise then that a person who has too high opinion of himself is unaware of it? So there are a lot of people today, more importantly, probably of greater concern for us would be there are a lot of Christians today, people who claim to follow Christ, that are living in a prideful way and we don't realize the pride is plaguing our life. At least Naaman had the benefit of looking at his body and going, something is not right here. But many Christians today, many Christ followers today, go through life and we never have that introspective look into our soul and into our spirit to say something's disformed, something's disfigured, something's uh, something's losing its sensitivities to God's leading. Nancy Leigh DeMoss, a national Christian speaker, teacher, and author, asks this question to expose pride in her life. She said, when was the last time you said to a friend or a co-worker, a family member or a spouse, I was wrong? Please forgive me. I was wrong. Please forgive me. Now, I know for some of us that's really hard to do. So I'm going to help you. Look at the person next to you and just practice. You're not really wrong, but just practice. Say to the person next to you, I was wrong. Okay, like eight of you did that. Seriously, turn to the person next to you (laughs) and say, I was wrong. (laughs) Okay, now the other person. Here's where you say, here's where you say, other person, you're right, you were. (laughs) (laughs) But here's the thing, when was, seriously, when was the last time you and I said to a, a spouse, said to a child, said to a parent, said to a coworker, said to an employee or our employer, when was the last time we said, I was wrong, please forgive me? And she goes on to point out, if you've not done that in the last month, you need to mark that down. Don't mark it down because you're perfect. You need to mark it down because you're not seeing the areas in life where you were wrong. Intentionally, unintentionally, it doesn't matter. You're not seeing where you were wrong. Or you're seeing it and you're refusing to admit it. She goes on, and and I would encourage you, if this is of great interest to you and you don't think that you're proud, take this pride test. You can Google it. Um... I had a, a, a dear lady one time tell me, you just, if you don't believe that, you get online and you just goggle that. So you go home and goggle it, and you type in pride test Nancy, this is her name, Nancy DeMoss, D-E-M-O-S-S. And she'll come up with a list of questions that are really revealing. Some of them, in the spirit of, you might be a redneck if, we're going to say you might be prideful if. You might be prideful. Some of the questions she lists, if you look down on those who are less educated, less affluent, less refined, or less successful than yourself. You might be prideful if you think of yourself as more spiritual than your mate or people in your church. That's where you look at other people and you go, oh, why don't they just love Jesus as much as I do? It's it's a haughty attitude. It's a spirit of pride. Or you might be prideful if you have a judgmental spirit towards those who don't make the same lifestyle choices that you do, whether it's the dress, what they wear, uh, how you school your kids, entertainment standards, when you have that judgmental attitude. Or, Or you might be prideful if you're quick to find fault with others and then verbalize it even to others. You have that critical tongue, although in church we try to call that discerning. You might be prideful if you frequently correct or criticize other people. You might be prideful if, this one's going to maybe hit home in our culture today, you might be prideful if you give a lot of time and attention to your physical appearance, hair, makeup, clothing, body, uh, body weight, body shape, not trying to look older. Yeah, I had, uh, I'll never forget, I was at the back door one Sunday a number of years ago, and a guy that I kind of knew but hadn't seen for about a year, he came back to church, and as he walked up at the end of service, I was standing back there, and he walked up, and he just kind of smiled, and he patted me on the stomach, and he goes, oh, you're putting on a little weight there, aren't you? (laughs) I said, well, yeah, but in a couple months, I can lose this. You're still going to be ugly. (laughs) (laughs) No, I didn't say that. I just thought it. 
Yeah, I know. Preachers aren't supposed to say it. Turn the other cheek. I, I get that. Here's the thing, though. No, I don't think any of us like for someone to come and make those glaringly obvious observations, do we? Don't, don't tell me I'm fatter. I know I'm fatter. You think my pants don't scream that every day? <laughs> you put them on and your button goes, <laughs> Don't tell me this is a mess in my life or that's a mess in my life unless you're approaching it with the spirit and the attitude of, I am concerned about you and I care about you. you we're prideful if we spend too much time on our appearance. That's not an excuse for me just to be a slob, though. Here's the deal, though. You're prideful if you have a hard time admitting when you're wrong or confessing your sin to God and others. You may be prideful if you desire to be in control and the world revolves around you and things have to be your way and they have to work your way. And if it doesn't, then you're going to be mad or you're going to be silent. One author calls this the silence or violence response. You might be prideful if you become defensive when you're criticized or corrected. You might be prideful if you frequently interrupt other people when you're speaking or when they're speaking. I mean, and the list could go on and on, but you get the idea. These are not gospel, but these are definitely points to ponder and say, do I have a pride issue? Do I have a blind, blind spot in my life that I need to address? C.S. Lewis, famous author and Christian theologian, puts it this way. He says, the essential vice, the utmost evil is pride unchastity as he puts it greed drunkenness and all that all of that are mere flea bites in comparison to pride it was through pride that the devil became the devil he writes pride leads to every other vice pride is the complete anti-god state of mind that's why scripture directs us to have the same attitude of humility that jesus christ had because pride will disfigure, destroy, and desensitize you in your relationships with other people. If you're wrestling with pride in your life, as, as I often do, I want us to look at um, this idea of pride or the opposite of pride, the antithesis of pride, humility, because we see that really come to the surface in Naaman's life in this account. A guy who comes in basically chest thumping and look at me and here I am and why didn't you do this the way I wanted you to? Don't you know who I am? You could have come out. You should have done this. You Naaman does a flip and I, and I want us to see some of the things that he does because I think it's an example that you and I can follow to undermine this issue of pride in our life, to increase the humility in our life because until Naaman begins to humble himself, he doesn't see the healing that he's after. And I think that that principle is something that you and I need to grab onto because before God can heal relationships in our life, before God can transform relationships in our life, we have to have humility. Humility precedes healing, and we're going to see that right here. Humility precedes healing. I want us to, to look at just a, a couple things here as we get to that. Remember, um, he's ticked because Elisha didn't come out. Let's look at the transformation that takes place in verse 13. His officers reasoned with him. Naaman, he said, sir, if the prophet had told you to do something very difficult, wouldn't you have done it? So sure, certainly shouldn't you obey him when he simply says, go, wash, and be cured? So Naaman went down to the Jordan River. He dipped himself seven times as the man of God had instructed him, and his skin became as healthy as the skin of a young child, and he was healed. Then Naaman and his entire party went back to find the man of God. And they stood before him, and Naaman said, Now I know there is no other God in all the world except in Israel. So please accept a gift from your servant. Now remember, he's brought all these clothes. Uh, he's brought all this gold. He's brought all this silver. He's trying to give it to Elisha. And Elisha says this, As surely as the Lord lives whom I serve, I will not accept any gifts. And though Naaman urged him to take the gifts, Elisha refused. So Elisha, he wasn't doing one of these like a lot of people do. No, 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 no. No, 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 no. Don't do that. You, know, you, ever, you ever eat with somebody like that at a restaurant? Some of you will go, yeah, that's you, Tom. Um, when you go to pay the bill, and they're like, you know, one check. It comes on one check, and you go to pay the bill, and they're like, no, oh, let me get that. Oh, you want to pay for it? <laughs> You know, there, there's kind of an, an insincerity that occurs there. Elisha, after continual prompting by Naaman, 
take these gifts. You deserve these gifts. Look at what's happened. My king wants you to have these gifts. This is so incredible. He's like, no, because I think Elisha understands something, and this is what Naaman's going to learn, and this is what I think you and I can learn. It's that spirit and that attitude of humility. You see, I think Elisha understands that this is not about him. He's just the mouthpiece. This is really about God and Naaman. And more importantly than just God and Naaman's physical leprosy, I think Elisha even understands that this is about God and Naaman's spiritual condition of pride or leprosy. And, and so Elisha refuses the gifts in this Elisha perspective, this idea that humility precedes healing is something that Naaman experiences in his life and it dramatically changes him. A guy who was disfigured, a guy whose life was essentially for all intents and purposes over, all of his relationships strained, distant, and destroyed. He has a completely new life given to him. And so I want us to talk just in the few minutes we have remaining about three actions that can help you and I move towards this idea of humility in life. That can help you and I uproot, uh, dismantle pride in our lives. That can help you and I move into this uh, realm of humility in our relationship with God so that it can bring healing in our relationship with him and with others. Sound good? Let's look at a couple. Number one. First action, Naaman does this. Give up your right to be right. Well, you don't have to listen very long. You don't have to listen very long on the news. You don't have to listen very long where you work to conversations there. Go to, go to McDonald's. Go to Walmart. Listen to people talking. And it does not take long to hear, I have a right. It's my right. A lot of us have this idea that we have a right to be right. I can think what I want. I can say what I want. I can believe what I want. I can do what I want. I have a right to be what I consider right. But Naaman came to a point where he realized that maybe he, maybe he wasn't right. You see, pride is continually thinking, I'm right. It's my way. I've got to figure it out. But his servant said, consider. Just consider the fact that there could possibly be another way. See, if he would have asked you to go, you know, slay a dragon or bring me the head of my mortal enemy, you would have done that. But consider the fact that just simply going and washing in this mud hole will make a difference. At some point, before you and I can ever experience healing and humility in our lives, we have to give up what we perceive as our right to be right in the way that we see it. There are a number of people today that are distanced from God because they are sure that they've got a better plan than he does. I don't have to surrender my life to God. I can do what I want, when I want, and how I want. But consider the possibility that you are probably wrong. You could be wrong. Consider the possibility that Jesus meant what he said in Scripture when he said, if you do not, if you do not enter into a relationship with God through Jesus Christ, you're not going to spend eternity with God. Consider that Scripture may be right when it says, it does not matter how good you are. You will never be good enough, Tom, to go to heaven. It's about who you know. It's about the relationship with God. You have the right to be right, absolutely. God has given you the right to surrender yourself with Him and spend eternity with Him. He's also given you the right to reject Him, and He's going to honor that decision, and you'll spend eternity apart from Him. And in the meantime, before you step from this life into the next, you have the choice. Do you want to maximize this life as He grows you from the inside out, or do you want to do what you want to do and just kind of get through until it's over? You have a choice. But will you surrender? There are a number of people today that maybe we've said, I've given my life to Christ. So I'm good to go. 
but yet we want to hang on to our perceived right to live in that relationship how we want to live. Jerry Bridges writes an incredible book. It's called Respectable Sins. And in that book, he goes through and talks about how in the church today and in our Christian lives today, those of us who claim to be Christ followers are living in so many different ways that are contrary to Scripture. And somehow we've bought into the, the false reality that that's okay. And he goes down, he addresses a list of, I mean, we could just look at it. You know, the idea of lust. Jesus says, if you lust after a woman, you've committed adultery. The same still applies. If you lust after a man, you've committed adultery. Because it's out of that lustful heart that adultery grows. And Jesus says, just because you didn't touch, but you look, that's not cool with him. Or murder. Jesus says, if you hate somebody, it's that, that attitude of anger and hatred, and it, it's the same as murdering them. Scripture addresses a number of areas in our lives that we just excuse. Lack of self-control. Impatience, jealousy, unthankfulness, discontentment, worry, gossip, lying, self-centeredness, judgmentalism, unwillingness to forgive. I mean, the list could go on and on and on. And yet we think that I can enter into your relationship with you, God. And I don't have to surrender what I perceive to be right. I want the benefits of this relationship, but I want to do it my way. Pride keeps you and it keeps me from saying, God, you're right. I'm wrong. I'll do it your way. Proverbs chapter 16 puts it this way, verse 18. Pride goes before destruction and haughtiness. It's kind of arrogance. goes before a fall. In verse 20, he goes on. It says, those who listen to instruction, talking about God's instruction, will prosper. But those who trust the Lord and those who trust the Lord will be joyful. Consider that God may actually know more than you and me. So his, his servants are saying, hey, Naaman, why don't you consider this? He's like, mm, okay, I've considered it. There's a possibility. So he goes to the Jordan River. Now, granted, it is like traveling from here to the Wabash. He goes to, to the Jordan River, and, and here's the second principle. You've got to take the steps you're told to take. Before humility is going to bring healing in our life, we have to take the steps we're told to take. There are a lot of people who've entered into a relationship with God going, yes, I believe that what you said you meant, and yes, I'm going to surrender my life to you, but it doesn't go much farther than that. We believe it here, but it never reaches here. We believe it in our mind, but it never changes the way that we live. Take the steps you're told to take. Some will say, I know that God is right, and I know that he knows best, but uh, this time i got to take a shortcut. You know, Naaman could have said that. Now, I know, I, I, okay, taking a bath is going to get rid of this, but you know what? I think I'm going to go home because um, the rivers back there, the Abana and the Farfar, are better rivers than we have here. So I'm going to do what you said. I'm just going to kind of, I'm going to take a shortcut on this one, God. We want healing in our lives but we don't want surrender but true humility is not just a thought process it's not just considering that god is right but true humility lives and breathes in our daily life and in every step that we take in life and you and i can say that we have faith in god and we believe he knows what's best but it does not mean anything if we don't live it out humility is is much like James describes faith in chapter 2, verse 14. It's where we say God is right, and we we put feet to that. We put skin in the game, so to speak. And James chapter 2, verse 14 says, What good is it, dear brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith, but you don't show it by your actions? Can that kind of faith save anyone? You see, we say, God, I'm setting my pride aside. I believe that you know what is best. I believe that you want what is best. I believe that you'll do what is best in my life. So I'm going to obey you. James goes on in verse 17. He says, so you see, faith by itself isn't enough. Unless it produces good deeds, it's dead and useless. Regardless of whether it makes sense to you or makes sense to me, go bathe in the river like Naaman did. Regardless of whether it seems beneath you, it seems too dirty, the task seems too too small, 
do what God said to do. Take the steps he said to take. The third leap would be this. Commit to the journey. Commit to the journey, not just a jog. And by that I mean this. There are a lot of people that committed to physical health at the beginning of this year. Probably one of the, the, uh, the most widespread New Year's commitments. Physical health. But already statistically over half of those people have already chosen to fail and not pursue any more that commitment. We had a good idea, and, and as the season takes off, a lot of people joined health clubs. A lot of people joined exercise groups. A lot of people got involved with different diet companies, and we're going to change everything. I'm going to make my life better this year. I'm going to feel physically better, and we do the same thing with God in our spiritual life. Now's the time. I'm going to make a change today. I'm going to get rid of pride in my life. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to grow this humility in my life because I want God to change my life spiritually. And we get a little bit down the road, and we're like, eh. I'm not really seeing the results I want. The weight's not coming off as quick as I thought. This is a lot of work. I have to get up early in the morning. It's getting cold out. Ah, this, ah, some other time. I don't want to do this anymore. And what we've done is we've committed to a few jogs, but we don't have the, the long-range vision to see that this is a journey. This is a lifetime event. There will not be a point in time next week, next month, or next year where you have humility figured out. It's going to be a lifelong process where God takes us through hills and valleys. We go through the fire and the rain where things are great and then they're not. And it's in that journey that he grows humility in our lives. Naaman had to travel well over 100 miles. He was in the heat. He wasn't feeling well. He had to make two stops, one to see a king that couldn't help him and one to go see a prophet who didn't come out and talk to him. And then to top it off, he had to go bathe in a mud hole. But it was that entire journey that had to unfold before he reached a point of healing. And get this, when he gets to the river, he goes down in it and he goes down and comes up once. He goes down and he comes up twice. There's a third time and a fourth time, nothing has changed. And there will be points in your life as, as there are in mine that we will obey God once, twice, three, four times and we go, I don't see where it's making a difference. He goes down a fifth time. He goes down a sixth time. But you see, because this is a journey and not just a, a short jog or a short sprint, when he comes up the seventh time, the Bible says his skin was healed. It was like that of a child. There's a movie that my family and I watched just in the past week. Forever Strong is the name of the movie, and there's a rugby coach in that movie that had a line I thought was, was really profound. And he said to one of his players, this is what I want you to do in this game. And the player's response was, okay, coach, I'll try. And the coach stopped him. He goes, don't try. Do. I thought, man, isn't that how we approach our relationship with God? Hey, I want you to stop lying. I want you to stop gossiping. I want you to stop having fits of rage. I want you to stop. He goes down the whole long list, and we're like, okay, God, yeah, I'll try. I'll try. No, I don't want you to try. I want you to do because what try says is, I did my best at the time. I'm not perfect, don't you understand? But when you and I commit to God that we're going to do, that has a whole different ring to it that I'm not going to quit until this task is accomplished in my life, until my mission is over. Don't just try, do. So that you can say, and I can say, as the Apostle Paul says in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7, I have fought the good fight. I've finished the race, and I've remained faithful. Now the prize awaits me, the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on the day of his return. And the prize is not just for me, Paul writes, but for all of those who eagerly look forward to his appearing. 
I saw a quote on a poster this past week. It said, difficult roads often lead to beautiful destinations. The problem is too many people are in it for the jog and not the journey, and we quit before we ever reach that destination. You want to experience revival in your life. It starts with a contrite and humble spirit. You want to experience revival in, in your home or with your children or your marriage or your friends or the people you work with. It starts with humility and a contrite, lowly, and broken heart. Second Chronicles chapter 7, a verse I'm sure you've heard before, but I want to read it again. It says, Then if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, God says, I'll hear from heaven and forgive their sins and restore their land. And my eyes will be open and my ears will be attentive to every prayer made in this place. Don't you see humility precedes healing? Please pray with me. Dear Heavenly Father, you are truly a great and awesome God. Lord, the thought that we might in some way, shape, or form be smarter than you, have a better plan than you, know better than you, is really when we think about it is ludicrous. God, you are the creator of life, and thereby you know how it best works. You were the one that established an opportunity for us to have a relationship with you through your son Jesus and his death on the cross. And so now, Lord, we would ask that you open our eyes to the areas of arrogance in our life, that you might help us root that out, that you might help grow us in humility, that we might become the people that you have designed and desired us to be. So that you through us can change not only our own lives, but the lives of those around us. That you might restore not only our relationship with you, but the relationships of those around us. That you might give us a heart to see others as you see them. And that, Father, you would be glorified in the process. Lord, we thank you for your love. We thank you for your sacrifice. We thank you for your grace. Please give us the courage to take the first step back in our relationship.